host Scott Ramp. Uh, things are going to be a little bit different for my morning show this time around because I have no uh, direct link to my computer. We're not giving a, a good signal directly from my computer to the TriCaster system that it's currently using right now. And it has probably a lot to do with the uh, device that converts HDMI to SDI. More on that later. Actually, I'm done talking about it. The US legislation didn't shut down because otherwise no one w in power would be getting paid and plenty of reps would not stand by and let not w getting paid get in the way of getting paid. Uh, the debt ceiling was raised following a bipartisan deal from Senate Majority Chuck Schumer and Republican Leader uh, Mitch, uh, Mitch McConnell to avoid immediate threat of default by shifting it to early December for the deadline. So far they are giving more breathing room for Joe Biden's tactics of let him fail because we need to get Joe Manchin and Christian Sinema to agree to something as they are the only holdouts uh, from the $3.5 trillion spending plan which if you look actually look into would go into uh, green energy jobs, bridges, uh, all sorts of infrastructure type plans and also uh, uh, price pricing for pharmaceuticals. And uh, one thing that's really interesting is in terms of negotiating lower uh, pharmaceuticals is that Joe Manchin's daughter, Heather uh, Brish, who owns a stake in EpiPens, seems to have conflict of interest. And uh, Mrs. Cinema is uh, so far gone. She's already looking into private sectors and doesn't seem to care what she leaves behind. Cinema had to deal with protesters following her into the bathroom to confront her for opposing parts of uh, B President Biden's agenda. New York Times reports that a moderate Dems wrote a letter uh, uh, basically uh, 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 demonizing the efforts of the protesters and Bernie Sanders of, Ver of Vermont is pretty much done and did not sign that open letter to her. Ms. Cinema has also been one of the most elusive senators in Capitol Hill since 2018. She rarely engages with reporters, does not hold public events in Arizona, has, has, has effectively cut off communication with local progressive groups. Lots of stuff happening, or should I say not happening, in the progressive bill and all the distractions and holdouts. California and um, in other news, California can't seem to catch a break because an oil spill on the coast of Long Beach, south of LA, has resulted in tens of thousands of gallons of crude oil into the ocean of Southern California. A small, uh, a permitted, uh, a, a smell permeated uh, Friday night, and they were able to confirm Saturday morning about the spill. As of Wednesday, the cause was still uncertain, while some say it was a ship's anchor which cracked an underwater pipeline about 13 inches long. The ecological disaster is affecting a few marshlands and fishing in the area is closed for weeks. We won't know the real impact much later, but projections and the economic loss is up to 126,000 gallons of uh, heavy crude oil, but some reports around 29,400, according to Amplify, the Texas-based oil company who owns the pipeline. Uh, currently, Rotterdam Express, uh, the German flagged container ship, was under investigation for the 13-inch crack because they were assuming that it was an anchor that was dropping right onto the pipe but the National Guard has since cleared them as of Wednesday. Combating, um, in other news, combating homelessness has hit a snag when a homeless shelter executive defrauded millions of dollars that should have gone towards helping those in need. The New York Times uh, broke the story about the nonprofit Beach House, based out of New York, has taken in more than $352 million since 2017 for shelters it operates, including Beach House. Its president, Jack Brown III, collected annual compensation of more than $1 million. Um, his mother, his sister, Aunt and niece have all worked for the nonprofit. So his brother, making a six, so uh, so also his brother, hi, who uh, is reported has been making a six-figure salary on this as well. In Vegas, there is w uh, just went two shelters that were run by Beach House, and it wasn't hard to trace it back to the executive uh, Jack Brown III. The Times investigated in 2012 found that Brown started a nonprofit that won $29 million federal contract to provide housing, jobs, and drug rehabil rehabilitation. Uh, services to people leaving prison, but few of those services were actually delivered. So the story it kind of like kind of leads me into this next story about uh, I know I've uh, mentioned this before, but there is a new mining company that's coming into the state of Montana, and one of the presidents, uh, Phil pa Philip Baker Jr., uh, who uh, wants to come back to Montana after decades of pollution through the gold and mine operation, a uh, company that went bankrupt in 1998, known as Pegasus. So Helka is one of those companies that wants to go to Montana to mine. And uh, as a state, uh, so earlier what happened after 1998 is that the state of Montana came together and says, hey, listen, we, uh, if we can't blame the company, we should at least find a way to have a bad, a bad actor law enacted in the wake of the Pegasus bankruptcy, which punishes companies and their executives who do not clean up their mining pollution. But for some reason, Baker decided to come back to try mining uh, yet again. 
So far, uh, environmental groups, uh, the Montana Environmental Information Center, Earthworks, and several other groups sued Montana Governor Gene Forte's administration for the Department of Environmental Quality's dropping of the suit in 2018. It's not only Gene Forte Forte's fault, but not doing anything, but the, the Department of Environmental Quality said that it may not have been worth it to go after Helka. Uh, but of course, I'm not saying that Helka is bad, but at the same time, the bad actor that comes from Helka, uh, Philip Baker Jr., is. The city of Missoula and Pavarel Center are teaming up to provide Johnson Street shelter for oh, the warming shelter. So as of November 1st, the warming shelter will be open. And so far, the Missoula will be giving out $311,000 of the American Rescue Plan ARPA funds and co of COVID relief money for this, uh, and also matching funds through many other organizations, which I'll talk a little bit more in my city council report, totaling up to more than half a million dollars for uh, shelters and homeless care going into the winter. Up next, we have a great short for our very own Joel Baird, and he uh, d visited uh, the Garvin ci uh, Garden City Harvest, and they're talking about community gardens in the city of Missoula. So here is the story, and when I come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some movies. Hello, everyone. I'm Joel Baird, the general manager of Missoula Community Access Television. I'm here with Emily Kearns Guapa and DeHandra Kwong. They both work in one of the community gardens of Garden City Harvest. We're going to spend some time today talking about the community gardens and how, if you're interested, you could find yourself gardening in the spring of 2022. some typical questions you may have if you've never gardened before and if you're interested in getting your own garden plot right here in Missoula. Dehanza, we'll start with you. What is your role here with the community gardens of Garden City Harvest? Of course, um, my role is as community gardens assistant. So I am here to back up our amazing director and make sure that all of our gardeners and gardens are taken care of. So Dehanza and I manage the 11 community gardens in Missoula. Whoa. Yeah. Do you hear that? 11 community gardens. And what we hope to do on this short program is show you the locations of those gardens so that you may dream about this winter a garden close to you. And we're going to tell you how you can sign up and what you can expect once you've done so. Mm -hmm. Anyone can rent a garden plot. And we provide the soil. We bring in compost in the spring. We provide water and tools. Um, and we also provide a lot of educational opportunities. Um, we bring in some free seeds as well. And we have garden mentors and leadership committee members and staff that are knowledgeable about gardening. And we have a blog and workshops and are essentially here. So if a gardener has a question and you're new to gardening or have never gardened in Missoula, we can help you have a successful garden. I've been gardening here since 2015, since this garden opened. And the thing I love most about being a community gardener is the community, honestly, being able to be here and garden with other people, see what other people are growing in their plots and trade advice and trade produce. And honestly, also handing out produce to the little kids that walk by. That's like the very best thing. <laughs> we want this to be a personalized experience. You can grow what you would like to grow food-wise. And so it's very important that um, you just try the best you can. There's no judgment here. You're just trying to grow some food. Mm -hmm. And I would say that what's great about having a community garden plot, it really is your garden and you can plant whatever you want. So there's a lot of variety of beets and tomatoes and squash and flowers. And here's a raspberry. 
That's a good one. Oh, yeah, that worked. <laughs> yeah, so this gardener has planted almost all flowers specifically for the pollinators, which benefits everyone, everyone growing vegetables. She has a little fairy garden inside. Mm-hmm, you can see the house. That is enormous. I know. <laughs> oh yeah, there. It's oh yeah. <laughs> and leaning to the east. Yeah. Um, marigolds have a couple different benefits um, as like a companion plant to vegetables. They do say they deter pests, but they also bring in beneficial insects. So you can rent a community garden plot for uh, forty to seventy dollars per season, and the plot fees are on a sliding scale. So it could be $40 based on your household size and income or $55 or $70 is the um, upper tier for plot rental fees. And there's also an additional $20 refundable deposit. So we ask that you pay that up front, but then if you don't abandon your plot, you will get that $20 back at the end of the year. And then in addition to the sliding scale, we also offer scholarships. So um, we offer a number of scholarships every year. You just need to reach out to us um, and there's also an application online and fill out an application and Garden City Harvest will cover the plot fee. So all you have to pay is the $20 refundable deposit, which like I said earlier, you will get back at the end of the year um, as long as you take care of your garden bed and winterize it in October. People will plant big pumpkins or some people plant corn. A lot of people will plant carrots and beets and tomatoes and zucchini. Um, but our plot sizes, they range in size depending on the garden location. Um, they're usually around 10 feet by 10 feet or 15 feet by 15 feet, which is actually a really big space. So you can grow a lot of food for you or your family. And in past surveys, when we've asked gardeners um, how much money they've saved on their grocery bill per week during the peak gardening season. Most, a lot of people say they save up to $25 per week um, by just eating the food that they grow in their garden plot. Not only do we have our community gardens where you can rent your own plot, um, we also have a community garden spe specifically for growing food for the um, food bank. And we also have had many gardens this year do produce runs for the food bank as well. So if you can't eat all the things that you grow, if you're a master gardener and you run out of things, you can always um, donate to the community so you're giving back. Several of our garden sites have raised garden beds, which makes it a lot easier for people that have a hard time gardening at ground level. So. This garden, the Bitterroot Line Garden, as well as the Roots Off Reserve Garden, and the Milwaukee Trail Garden, and the Ivy Street Community Garden all have raised beds that you could rent out. And we've heard from gardeners that they really appreciate using the raised beds because it is a lot easier on their body. There are a lot of people who will get down in the dirt with you or up in the dirt if you have one of our ADA accessible beds and um, have some fun. So. With our scholarship program and with other um, things that we have to offer the community, there's no reason stopping you. We'd love to have you be part of the Garden City Harvest family. There's a sense of community and getting to know your neighbors getting by getting to know your fellow gardeners. And under normal years without a pandemic, we host work days, we have potlucks, um, there's been little garden tours. Our garden leadership committees are responsible for creating um, fun community building events at the garden as a way to get to know each other and to share food and and share gardening tips and things like that so it really is like a well-rounded holistic fun time if you are interested in gardening at one of our community gardens then you can go to our website and apply online so go to www.gardencityharvest.org and then click on the community gardens page and click on New Gardeners, and you'll see a list and a map of all of our garden locations, as well as an application that you can fill out online. And we are accepting New Gardener applications now, all the way through mid-March, or actually the end of March, 
Um, and we will do a spring garden plot lottery and give people new gardeners plots by mid-April. And then you can go to your new garden and start digging in. Welcome back. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but maybe the poster and kind of like what, I, what everyone kind of already knows about it. It's time for Dying Forever, Never Again, Now. Oops, got delayed again. And what it would have said, but no one goes to the movies anymore. But the deal with some of these movies uh, demands a theater presence, so this is not streaming. Uh, nor will it be streaming for another year or two. Uh, no Time to Die, as you've seen the trailer over and over and over and over and over and over again with the new uh, 007 agent. But the old man won't leave. Daniel Craig plays the I'm getting too old for this in a movie following the success of getting the main bad guy from the first one, but clean enough after the doc, no type of character. More bad guys, more bad guys. There is the theme to these movies, and it's old man, secret agent, British, and woman half his age. Enjoy, boomers. Uh, then we have a family of Norwegians have an intense empty nest syndrome and raise a lamb, hence the movie called Lamb, as human, um, and also alludes to the fact that the lamb is kind of humanoid, but they just kind of ignore that completely. So anyways, watch uh, Numi Rapace from the wor uh, worst best alien prequel movie, uh, Raise a Kid as Normal as Possible with some um, people being taken aback at first. But we'll be like, okay, whatever, <laughs> empty nesters. Uh, that's basically the movie. Obscure, but played straight for an audience, kind of like uh, this David Lynch BS. Uh, this next one, and we got speed round going on here, so let's talk as fast as, po fa fast as possible. Can't make a drama romance without somebody dying with cancer. South of Heaven is a guy from Ted Lasso and a girl from Ant Man movies. Jimmy, rough, po past man, connects with his long lost love who dies after brief happiness. Mass, about a ma uh, movie about a mass shooting and the aftermath of two families looking to uh, process their grief. No joke here. Mass shooting sucks. It's an epidemic. Uh, then Survive the Game, basically old Henry from last week's speed round, but based on modern times where a guy who's harassed by cops and criminals wants sh people off his farm. Uh, bang, bang, stand your ground kind of movie with Bruce Willis. Up next, we have a brand new dub and stuff, uh, and it uh, features uh, invisible ghosts. So without further ado, here's this, and when I come back, we're going to kind of talk about some city council, which will be rough. I can promise you. You see? You mess with big oil, you get the chair. All right, let's do this tram trial. Don't just leave me hanging. I'll leave you hanging. And that's when the pig said, bah ram you, and I was like, what are you talking about? Well, and then I found myself suddenly controlled by the pig. It was really weird. And then the cabaret started singing, we are, we are. The youth of the nation, and I was like, "Ugh, oh, come on, with this again." Maybe if I just sit here looking interested, this video will be interesting. And then I think I heard him say, "You people," and I was like, "What did you just say?" Wait, what was that? No, I actually don't know the defendant. Thank you. All right, all right, all right I've heard enough. I'm pretty sure he's guilty. Let's get her done. Dixon sentenced to die to pay supreme penalty for Mannix murder. Airbag, see other side. Airbag, see other side. Airbag. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. It can't be. No, 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 <sighs> no. Will anyone no, let me no, talk? No. Come on, Judge. You have to be a little more lenient than that. Perhaps we can get him in life in prison. We can't just send him to die. Oh, come on. Trials don't last that long. All right, right listen here. My final decision is final. You can try appealing to the higher court, but I really doubt they're going to go any further because this is a felony. This is a state crime. So it has nothing to do with the federal crime. The state's up to all this stuff. Legal, legalese. And I say unto thee, Shakespeare really ruined how English was taught in my school. Kind of like Curse of Ruin the way I printed my name. I, I looked at my first and second grade homework. I, uh, ho homework. But it's, and look, the, the writing was perfect, but as soon as I learned cursive, forget about all the good penmanship, just out the window. <laughs> I tell you this, young man, this world is not for people like us. People who just want to go back to second grade where your mom prepared your lunch and you would have to minimum workload from school. <laughs> when they spoke about civil rights, they'd play I Have a Dream, hoping that they could gaslight racism out of the public schools. But I digress. Okay, I'm rambling. But I believe that by belief itself, you can learn to Dougie. And yes, I mean the Nickelodeon show, not the hip-hop song. And amen.
Well, he's probably being read his last will and testament. I have something very important to tell you, and it all starts with... Oh, excuse me for a second. Hello? Publisher Clearinghouse? Yes, I am interested. Hey guys, welcome back. Now it's time for the roughest uh, city council I've done in a while. And I'm going to be kind of going back and forth between quotes. There might be some missteps here and there, but I'm running it through the TriCaster system and not through the computer that I would usually be doing. So just a disclaimer right here, right now. And I'll try to get through this as, s as swiftly and as smoothly as possible. One of the big things that is happening is that the city is finally moving forward on uh, presenting a grant through the CBDG and home grant. And they're looking to get some uh, ARPA and also... Ca uh, CARES Act relief money to go towards affordable housing and potentially they had a presentation in terms of putting money towards a new park and renovations to what's called Lions Park which is just off of Russell Street and uh, Heather Harp talks about the money and says that we shouldn't use that money to fund parks and this is what she had to say. At the end of the day when I think about what our community has to prioritize it's got to be housing and these resident-owned communities, um, in my opinion, should take precedent and priority over downtown Lions Park. Um, I, from, from what I remember of asking Kaya, this was um, an ask for $1.9 million, which would help 20 households to the tune of about $65,000 apiece. And I know a lot of those folks have been living in those same sh trailers for a long period of time. And if we take that 65,000 divided by $425, which is what they've been paying in rent each month, they could have bought this over a period of 10 years. And they didn't have that opportunity until today when the price tag is much higher. So I think that's how I would recommend we prioritize it. So NeighborWorks and the City of Missoula are looking to uh, use some of this money to keep people in trailer parks or those uh, constructed mobile homes and whatnot. Uh, I talked a little bit more about it uh, last week, but a little bit more, I think this is a very good program in place because uh, for the last, uh, basically from like 2010, 2000, 2018, even long before the pandemic, uh, trailer parks have been a huge target in terms of uh, just uh, um, a lot of the land just being sold right for, uh, right from under them. So a lot of them had to move their mobile homes or if they couldn't afford to, it would have to have them demolished. And so a lot of people would be out of home and had a luck. And so the organization Neighbor Works have been working, mm, get it, uh, to uh, with these neighborhoods to help uh, get these, uh, uh, these uh, kind of like a, uh, the people to be able to buy the land that's under them that they have been renting for so long. But the one of the biggest issues is it costs a lot more money to do. So, uh, so they go basically for $400 a month to about $1,000 per month. And so this money, they hope to lower it down, but they're not going to pay uh, less than $400 or keep on paying the $400, but they will be paying $600, but it'd be more towards owning the land in their trailer parks as well. So last couple of weeks, they have presented on, the, on this grant and how the, they can help folks stay in homes and affordable housing. Uh, so far, this, uh, these are COVID funds and prioritize both outdoor space and housing. I'm going to speak out of turn and now say it would be nice to have more parks, but maybe people should uh, people struggling to find homes. Uh, um, OK, anyways, uh, like Grant, this is a competitive fund that w they're going against other communities in the state of Montana and not just pulling money out of the air. Uh, public uh, comments I introduced David Gray, who had this to say. Uh, the park is serving a ton of low-income families that are just down the street and that are scheduled to fill that area with the planning that's ahead of it. They don't have any playground area for any of the children unless they have to cross uh, West Broadway and make their way all the way to the school, which is the only park in that area. So I think it is a good idea to put money towards that park because it's going to help out I'm not sure how many people are in that housing project down the street, but I'm going to guess it's around 60 families down there, you know, and you'd be helping them out. We've been looking at trying to do something to help those families in the park for years, and I think this is a good opportunity. 
Oh yeah, and Missoula is very pro park <coughs> and uh, you know per open space. Look, you know, looking to help you know Parks and Rec are great amenities to have. And Gwen Jones wishes we can fund all the projects, but we do need to prioritize housing. And this is what she had to say. There's all sorts of need in Missoula, so all of the thought that's gone into creating these applications is much appreciated. Um, just to put my own two cents in, I think they're both very worthy projects. I'd be very happy if both were funded. But for now, I do think the priority is housing, and I would put my uh, put my vote of support to prioritize housing. All right. So, uh, uh, Parks and Rec Director Donna Glockler also spoke on this matter. Uh, she gave the presentation on uh, uh, amplifying Lions Park and putting some funds towards this to improve it, to improve the corridor. This is basically kind of like in the area off of a. Uh, 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 near the Clark Fork River off of Rus uh, Russell Street, and they gave like a kind of a satellite view of what they want to hopefully do with it, in improve parks, have some more trails in the background area, and also the whole area in general uh, that they want to uh, update is uh, uh, kind of a second thought in a lot of communities, and they want to hopefully pr provide more outdoor space for people to recreate and work with as well. Uh, so this is what actually Donna Gockler spoke on this, and then she she's pro housing, and this is why she said it. I think it's important, though. Uh, it's interesting when you apply for grants, uh, different criteria scores differently, and if in our um, best scenario we enhance our enhance our housing capacity, and we give those folks who are living in this high density housing or in these mobile homes an opportunity to be in a really great park after they have secured housing. So thank you. Uh, All right. So, so uh, city wants their cake and eats it too, but the overwhelming support for housing has led to the city prioritizing uh, this for their grants pitch. So far, this is they voted in favor of this. Eleven voted aye. One was absent uh, in the city council. Up next, the big Missoulian building. So uh, this is a 500 South Higgins because our old location for MCAT was 500 North Higgins. Kind of fun about the whole symmetry of. Uh, how uh, everything kind of goes for full circle in terms of things moving and things changing. Uh, but uh, they're looking to rezone for commercial industrial uh, to commercial residential because originally, you know, it was a paper mill and it, you know, wasn't uh, zoned for commercial use. And I'm not much of a betting man, but like I said last week, the city will probably turn, uh, like the city has no actual say in what they're going to be built on this. But my assumption is they're going to turn this into apartment complexes with uh, an emphasis on businesses on the first floor with apartments and other stuff on the next two floors. David Gray speaks during public comment and this is what he had to say. Well, I would hate to lose the Missoulian building as an iconic building in the downtown. Uh, its uses are probably not necessarily the best. And so I think it's a great location. Uh, I hope it's a real high density housing and commercial facility there, bringing life to that side of the river. And our Missoula is a, a, a good- uh, I think we do wanna be- board and trying to get, um, you know, more density. Our Missoula with the housing policy that they've been working on for the last like five, s six years and are constantly working on it, rezoning it, part of the Title 20 downtown master plan. And, uh, you know, higher density in the downtown area while also having that more diversity and uh, more uh, distance kind of typical neighborhood housing for the way you get from the city of Missoula because they really just can't have those uh, uh, houses on big lots of property when you're in the middle of downtown Missoula. They want to totally make that a lot big bigger. And so Gwen Jones reflects on the potential for higher level buildings, and this is what she says. Careful about preserving our river corridor, but I would point out that not only is there open space in between this building and the river, we also have the Waterwise Garden, the Native Prairie, and the River Bowl. We have a lot of breathing room that um, right next to the river in terms of lots of green space and open space right in that general vicinity. So it's, it's to me, I think there's a good balance there. So I know this is a big change. I really hope that something beautiful goes in and it respects the character of the hip strip and there's wonderful interaction on the first floor with great retail. Um, we'll see, can't control all of those factors, but that's what I'm crossing my fingers for and I'm in favor of it, thank you. Of course, they do allude to the fact that when they were talking about those uh, a larger, uh, those 100 year plus buildings, they're off of the 4th Street, just down the way uh, past the Missoulian, they were talking about, it was like, oh, you know, there was a lot of controversy, a lot of going back and forth, a lot of this and that, and a lot of city having a lot of input on those affordable housing complexes that would be built there. Not to mention there was a controversy when someone made a, uh, a fake uh, kind of a, a guesstimate 
of exactly what would be built there uh, after the fact, which caused even more people to be angry. And so one thing I got to make clear, and especially that it's made clear during the city council meeting, is that this was a privately owned parcel of land that was sold by Lee Enterprises, uh, which owns uh, the Mausoleum building and the Mausoleum newspaper. And uh, they get to do whatever they want, um, I mean, within the zoning rights of the city of Missoula. So the, the, the city has the right to zone how they want this property to be, but they do not have the right to say what the building is going to look like or what the building is going to be, especially on the private parcel of land. The only reason they, they were able to leverage the 4th Street one was because they vacated a certain parcel of land, which the city owned, to help leverage for that um, additional affordable housing that they put on that 42-unit complex that is um, I, I don't know if it's even being built right now. Um, I haven't driven by there recently, and there's a lot of construction on Higgins Bridge, which I completely avoid <laughs> completely. So I'm going off topic, and th there, it, of course, that's a nice uh, thing about zoning and uh, other high restrictions in Missoula that have been in place. The requirement for height was related to the airport for planes f uh, flying back in the day, so don't expect to have those kind of 12-story buildings like another Wilma building there, but they're uh, looking to maybe possibly having uh, uh, definitely a higher building than what the Missoulian was, but the city cannot leverage the, uh, the new private owner uh, per state law. Uh, don't expect this to utilize affordable housing, unfortunately. They also spoke in length about the parking issue in the downtown area and that businesses that will be created there will also have more mixed residential using those spots. Heck, even here in the library is a mess. Uh, the librarians and staff have very limited parking, and we've had to resort to uh, stealing residents' straight st street parking, and residents have also been stealing the library's parking as well. So it's going to be a lot of back and forth, and so far the city has a lot of turnover at the leadership of the Parking Commission and of Mis the Parking Commission of Missoula, and hopes to get an assessment before long, because they wanted a whole thing about parking, uh, just as they're talking about the new Missoulian building. And I suggest you guys can check that out as well. But I'm going to be moving on to committee meetings, which they only have committee meeting, so it's singular. Uh, ad admi um, admin finance going to approving funds for the emergency winter shelter. I talked a little bit about this in my news news. Uh, uh, snooze report. Uh, uh, it's upon that's what I call it. It's uh, upon us again, and the city will allocate three hundred and eleven thousand dollars of American Rescue Plan ARPA funds that was approved by the city's uh, fiscal year twenty twenty two budget uh, cycle for this item. Uh, Emily Armstrong, community De development, talked a little bit more about this. The emergency winter shelter, the real goal is to reduce the number of adults sleeping in places not meant for human habitation during Missoula's most inclement weather. And that's the goal every year. Uh, and so we're just trying to figure out the best solution given COVID um, and the need for additional spacing and the fact that our shelters are still at half capacity. Okay, so... So just a quick overview of what we're talking about. We're talking about the Johnson Street Community Center, which is at 1919 North Avenue West. It's the same location that we operated emergency winter shelter out of last year. Um, the max capacity in that space with social distancing is 150 people. The intention is to have the building used for 24 seven indoor shelter, which is offering kind of those warming sites that aren't as accessible during COVID-19 um, for folks who are unhoused and unsheltered, just a 24 seven space to rest and receive food and be warm. Okay, so part of the issue, so, uh, so part of the issues going into the 2020s pandemic was services for the people who were cut in half. The Pavarella Center homeless shelter here in the city of Missoula uh, had to cut the residents down in half and they had to deal with the uh, overabundance of homeless folks, uh, people uh, losing their homes, and a lot of people struggling to keep housing during the pandemic as well. So what they ended up doing is they uh, opened up the Johnson Street uh, at 1919 North, uh, uh, North Street, and that was the old Czech Fire House. It's been a community, uh, kind of like its own community center, but uh, then they eventually turned it into what would be known as the additional warming shelter, an emergency shelter, not to be confused with what uh, Salvation Army did, which they do have a warming area there as well, but this Johnson Street is to provide a 24-7 hour service. Um, and uh, let's see, this, th this uh, but this emergency shelter uh, was planned for winter of, uh, it's going to be planned from November 1st until April of 2022. This is a continuation of last year's winter plan, um, which, you know, which was good because uh, I'm not saying it was good, but at the same time, it, uh, the pandemic kicks off in March by the time they start wrapping up the uh, Pavarella Center's uh, emergency winter shelter. So they had 
ample time to get prepared for the next winter for, uh, of 2020 to 2021 where they have all these plans you have these tosos sites which is the temporary safe outdoor space which is wh what they used on private property and they got it from united way i know a couple other church groups uh were able to come together to provide outdoor space for folks uh mostly to uh kind of encourage them to get away from the uh, reserve streetway and also stay uh get a f fair enough away from the river so uh a lot of a lot of the big issues a lot of the key phrases were uh you know uh, health concerns and the river health and all that stuff which is why they got rid of folks uh and they tore down a lot of those encampments off the broadway uh island uh so anyways uh so uh missoula served 400 homeless individuals and through anecdotal data thought over a thousand individuals were served in missoula according to june and uh, june story of by kpax Emily talks about funding for the emergency shelter because it's not just the city that's putting money into this, it's also many other organizations. The funding for this year is um, coming from three separate sources. The city of Missoula is contributing $311,000 through American Rescue Plan Act funds. Missoula County is contributing $100,000 through um, 50 per 50K is through the County Financial Assistance Fund, and then 50K is also from um, uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds, but through the county. And then the Human Resource Council is contributing funds through its Emergency Solutions Grant, so it will contribute $205,000 to Emergency Winter Shelter through those grant funds. And for the budget, it's going to be more than... Uh, we live in a very generous... At $615,000 more than that is going to this. It's also important to note that this is the first year that the city contributed about, the first year, the city only contributed about $50,000 for the Winter Shelter Salvation Army and a continuation, but the next year it, it was a little bit more money with the Pavarella taking more points in action because there was a lot of uh, trial and error for the first year of the Winter Warming Shelter. The city, uh, the community of, the, the Missoula citizens came to the city council and they were really worried about the, uh, the folks who were uh, dying of hypothermia uh, just intense cold, uh, making them, uh, I mean, having them being taken away in ambulances to the hospitals and stuff like that. And nowadays it's even more complicated going to the hospital as they are uh, devoting a lot of time to COVID. Um, so anyways, this is just a lot of uh, preemptive uh, uh, services that they want to look into to, to, to help. Uh, but also a lot of this money is going for affordable housing and sustaining housing on top of the list. Winter Shelter will start serving folks November 1st through April 2022 and will include security personnel, which is brand new, and they're figuring out how do they, they want to approach this, and they want to make sure that this is a 24-7, a safe place for folks to go to. And so far, the Pavarella Homeless sh Shelter is struggling with filling positions. It's not a lucrative position, and you have to work with folks who are not the most, uh, who are at the most sensitive times in their lives, whether it be related to mental illness, and all safety nets like family, friends, and institutions are not readily available to them. Jesse Yeager from the POV talks about Missoula leadership teams in terms of neighborhoods affected by homelessness next door. Community that uh, wants to uh, uh, support them on uh, vulnerable neighbors. So uh, I've appreciated those feedback. Um, we had a good conversation uh, earlier this week with leadership from Missoula County Public Schools who gave us some nice feedback around security and making sure that we're tracking uh, bus stops and stuff like that. So we're gonna be working to um, uh, get that information uh, into the planning process. Um, and then uh, um, uh, we have other meetings uh, scheduled into the future. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as is with anything around this issue, that's a mix of, of concern uh, versus, you know, wanting to help their neighbor. And the Pavarello Center is really committed to being open to those conversations, having solutions-based dialogue about things that we can address, and then being real clear and real honest about things that are part of the societal problems that we need to work on as a community. Uh, um, and uh, that uh, uh, is a community-wide response. Um, you know, the POV's role in this is to keep people alive um, during these coldest months. That's, that's our primary goal. Okay. So that so far, uh, this went through committee to be approved for Monday. And so far, uh, the, uh, if you want more information about admin uh, finance uh, committee meetings and also city council agendas and future meetings, you can go on to ci.missoula.mt.us. I'd show you the website, but like I said before, I cannot show you uh, the computer that I have to my left, which I usually could. So nonetheless, uh, thanks for joining me for the city council report. Up next, we have a couple art clips. One was m uh, made by one of our employees here, Moira. And uh, we also have a fun um, kind of a... Uh, retrospect of Neil Ambrose Smith uh, fe being featured at the Missoula Art Museum, Museum. So you're getting not only one art clip, but two featured here at the Missoula Public Library and at the Missoula Art Museum. One featuring a spontaneous construction 2021 
and then Resort Museum, um, uh, like I said, Neil Ambrose Smith. So here it is. Welcome to SpawnCon. SpawnCon, also known as Spontaneous Construction, is an event where teams of all ages have seven hours to compete in building objects, only with home resources materials. It's a crowdfunding event to fund the home resource organization. If you miss it this year, don't worry. It's an annual event that includes music, activities for all ages, and access to local food vendors. Although the location for the art pieces varies, the event usually takes place at Home Resource every year. Home Resource's mission statement is to create a more vibrant and sustainable local economy. As is described on their website, they collect and sell reusable materials, channel materials to those in need, provide meaningful work opportunities, and educate and inspire to promote a more sustainable future. As our vision states on their website, we envision a just and vibrant world built on the principles of sustainability where the potential of people, community, and materials is realized. SpawnCon is putting up each piece for auction on October 1st at 5 p.m. on their website. Be sure not to miss it. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some events that are happening. Let's start kicking things off. Yes, at the Museo Public Library, Spectre, uh, actually no, uh, this is Spectrum Discovery Area. I always get confused when I say museum. The Spectrum Discovery Center is open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. for visitors. With all ages to explore science, to exa exa um, engage in exhibits and activities. They have a giant light bright, uh, light bright people. I just saw it the other day. I'm like, I didn't know they had a giant light bright. That's cool. Um, and so they have that <laughs> going on. And I think believe they are open from Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the hours, uh, later hours might be adjusted, but then again, um, uh, other, other events that are happening here in the, uh, um, in the Mutant Public Library this morning are also Tiny Tales and Storytime, as always, where they do, uh, story time, and also they have, uh, Tiny Tales, which is more of a kind of sing-along, uh, play, and all that stuff. It, it, it is a fun experience for a lot of families and their caregivers, and the children, of course. 
uh, community connections, Families First Learning Lab. So th this is also on the second floor. Is the program consisted of many interactive exhibits for children that pop up at partner organizations, organizations and events throughout the, our community. These exhibits inspire hands-on explorations and play while focusing on building empathy and kindness, social and emotional development, cultural expression, and imaginative and dramatic play. Community connections activities are free and open to the public and is here at the Missoula Public Library. Yarns and watercolor. Um, Missoula Public Library Cooper Room and Blackfoot Room on the fourth floor. If you're interested in uh, doing some yarns or some watercolor, picking up a new skill or improving the skills that you already have, that is great for that. Um, you and Blackstone is a huge entrepreneur uh, kind of philanthropy uh, Kickstarter kind of group. Uh, it's a they're doing a business startup challenge is scheduled to take place in person on Friday, October eighth, which is happening right today. And so the UM Blackstone Launchpad with the UM College of Business launches two uh, competitions, Epic Pitch Competition, John Rafados Business Startup Challenge, which is the, it's the second one. It's what we're talking about, it's the 32nd John Rafado. Uh, I'm sorry if I butchered the name. Uh, these co competitions are designed for students to take their idea to the next level, connect with two mentors and investors, win initial funding money without uh, – in the thousands, mm, that's cool, and it's going to be in the Par TV building at the University of Montana. Uh, also, uh, what's happening in is they're going to be having a mural exhibit, "More Love" by Michelle Hogveld. Veld, sorry if I butcher that name. 4 p.m. Azel. It's going to be at uh, Ali's. Ali's Missoula, uh, Mo Missoula's Montana's revolving outdoor gallery will be featuring the vibrant colors and bold patterns of the international artist Michelle uh, Hogveld. In the uh, fall winter ex exhibition, in her mural of more love, Hogveld is uh, able to weave an exceptional abstract tapestry by stitching together vivid and bright colored gardens and geometric forms, creating a narrative love connection. The vibrant mural will expand the I uh, entire alley's alleyway, bringing light and warm beauty to the urban downtown through the darker winter months. This is a beautiful place, this place where we can come together for the common connection of love. Also tonight is the UM, Symphoni uh, Sy um, Symphon uh, UM Symphonic Wind Ensemble and University Concert Band is going to be performing at the Denison Theater. They've been working all uh, semester for this concert, and at 7.30 at the Denison Theater next to the Music Building, they'll be doing a lush uh, lyrical lines to music that will have you on your toes. Join us for an eclectic mix of works that draw from songs and dances featuring works by... <laughs> Ganger Reed and the Montana Premier... Um, Anna Clyde's Masquerade. So, and a couple other names I couldn't pronounce uh, right now because it's better said than read. Um, J and J Hauling Company Band, who is going to be uh, featured at the Union Club tonight at 9 p.m. If you're going out and about tonight, uh, but kicking things off for your Saturday event is that on Saturday we're going to have uh, you know markets and such. You know, if you're interested in do going out to the farmers market. Be sure to check that out. It's going to go on well until the end of October. So you only have a couple more weeks left to uh, get your uh, plants, your uh, locally for uh, uh, sourced foods, um, farm to table, all that kind of stuff. Sundays, a lot of great pumpkin patches are going to be open and all sorts of places you can go to, community gardens and all that stuff. It's going to be fun, great activity to uh, 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 enjoy the harvest and the bountiful uh, foods that are coming uh, that are freshly made and everything. Okay. Anyways, that's just a little bit of background. M Saturday markets, uh, farmers market, people's market, and the River Street market will be happening from about eight to about one p.m. Uh, different for tr it differentiates between markets, uh, starting times and ending times, but just uh, the best times are between nine and twelve, and then they'll start turning down about one. So. Uh, Botany for Beginners Lifelong Learning Center is a great uh, uh, organization that does adult education, GED programs, and also uh, just basic computer skills. If you're interested and you have no computer skills whatsoever and you want to learn a little bit more about that, because uh, I'm tired of showing people how to use their computer for the damn time. Uh <laughs> Lifelong Learn Sunny, Botany for Beginners. Are you curious about the names and traditional uses of flower shrubs and trees commonly found in the western Montana forest and uh, prairies? Meet the Lifelong Learn Sunny for a short classroom lesson in botany. Then be prepared for some hiking to explore Missoula uh, Botanical Hotspots. It's $26 for the class, and it is one session only. So it's going to and, – and a lot of these sessions have certifications and a lot of great stuff for you guys to put on resumes and whatnot. Paint Your Own Pottery Curbside Service, Newtown Arts C Community Center. Uh, look – so how it works, step one, look through uh, their available pottery and add to your desire to, uh, on your cart, complete your payment and submit your order, click yes, ship address to keep from re-entering your information. Uh, Clearwater uh, a resource 
uh, Council Fall La Larch Week. Sorry, let me re say that again. Clearwater Resource Council Fall Larch we Walk. Uh, Clearwater, uh, uh, it, this is crcmt.org. You can look for, for more information. Father and Stuff, Steve and Matt Arno will be the guides. Steve is a retired at USF uh, FS research scientist forester, and Matt is a DNRC forester practitioner. You get a gain better understanding of the ecology of the Girard Grove, large ecology and disturbance of the landscape. Uh, explore options for managing forest uh, structures to create a fire adapted community. Uh, Saturday drop-ins are also happening on Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. Any kids who are aged 8 to about 14 are welcome to join us for a drop-in. No uh, RSVPs. Drop-ins only. First come, first serve. Up to six kids are allowed. Um, and this is for stop animation, movie making, just some, some fun with that. And uh, we've been having low numbers for the last couple of weeks, just letting you guys know. But we're always open to have more and more kids to join us. And we, ha we have this whole studio kind of set up for kind of stop animation for as kind of like an entry point into a uh, more media production type stuff if the kids are interested in doing so because a big thing about media productions is that you can't do it alone but for stop animation you totally can all right so teen open studio Missouri museum uh, this is a free eight-week program beginning october 9th which is to which is tomorrow and it runs through november 20th this is a drop-in uh kind of like us so they meet saturday afternoons from one to three there will be open work time for teens and with free art supplies and the space to work there will be education intern on site to serve as mentor, welcoming teens to the space and assisting them in finding what they need. This program is capped at 12 participants and a first come, first serve drop ins welcome. You can call ahead or go to MissoulaArtMuseum.org for more information. Hey, if you're interested in giving back to the community, there is a trash cleanup at Greeno Park. Trash cleanup hosted by Sentinel High School Key Club and Watershed Education Ec uh, Network. Open to all community members, especially high schoolers looking to get outdoor and gain volunteer hours. Because, um, you know, uh, when in high school, I, I remembered I had to do some community service for high school. Uh, the cleanup will be from uh, 3 to 5 p.m. Bring uh, gloves, good walking shoes, layers for change in weather conditions, and a friend. Um, please contact Ella Barnes and uh, Aisha Weiss. Uh, 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 okay, I'm not going to read their emails, but you can look up this on MissoulaEvents.net. You can find this trash cleanup at Greeno Park. Hey, or you can just show up, and it goes from 3 to 5, and it's a great opportunity to do so as well. Uh, bring the supplies that you think you may need, maybe a trash bag, maybe a stick to stick it trash in and put it in. But anyways, that's what's happening from 3 to 5 tomorrow, and it's going to be for anybody who wants to clean up Greeno Park. Uh, Black Label Society will be playing uh, music at the Wilma. It doesn't actually say what kind of music it is, and I'm not looking into it. A uh, Logjam presents a please welcome back Black Label Society for a live in-concert performance at the Wilma. Uh, Gingers on Ice is a, a comedy duo of uh, two red-headed individuals uh, from Missoula who kind of go back and forth between here and L.A., and they're going to be perform performing at the Zootown Arts Community Center Saturday night at 7 p.m. Gingers on Ice is a live uh, blend of sketch, improv, and stand-up comedy featuring two red-headed comedians, Jacob Godby and Alex Tate, uh, winners of the best Missoula's Best Comedians in 2018. Um, and then also, if you want karaoke, Westside Lanes is doing karaoke Saturday night. Karaoke... Um, and uh, DJ, uh, you get uh, some DJ music at uh, the Badlander happening with Chris Moon on Saturday night. All right, Sunday, like I said, at Target Range Markets. Uh, most markets are going to be ending by the end of October, so this is your uh, last chance to check out Target Range. Uh, one of your last times at Target Range uh, Middle, s uh, Target Range Elementary School because it's a K through eight, and it's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. While the farms uh, go to this. Uh, you know, like be like, hey, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to go all the way downtown to the farmers market. What's have the people come to us? So uh, why don't the, the, so that's why they started doing this Target Range market over at Target Range. Of course, I'm assuming that's what they meant, but I'm just kind of speaking for, um, anecdotally. Alpine Artisans Tour of the Arts, Grizzly Claw Trading Company, Alpine Artists Tour of the Arts, Saturday, October 9th. Um, uh, oct oh, why does it say Saturday? But anyways. They're going to be featuring a di a different things happening as well. It's a self-guided tour, just so you guys know. This is a noon to 5 p.m. You can see over 25 artists that work in the studio galleries and local historical museums on this two-day self-guided tour. And this is at Grizzly Claw, Claw Trading Company for more information. You can call and contact Jenny at 406-754-0034. Uh, Again, that number is 406 seven five four zero zero thirty four for more information and this is part of the alpine artist tour of the arts uh dan uh debake 
Um, oof, sorry if I butchered the name. I'm horrible with names. Uh, a Draftworks Brewing Company is going to be performing some great music. He has a steel guitar. He lays it flat on his uh, on his um, lap, and he plays uh, very uh, crazy music that just kind of gets you really into it. It's a great uh, opportunity. He's been here for quite a while now, and uh, they regularly host local musicians and our sweet little Murphy stage three nights a week. And then it's going to be at Draftworks starting at 5 p.m. today. I mean, 5 p.m. <laughs> Sunday. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm getting a little too reckless this morning. And speaking of reckless, we got Reckless Kelly. is going to be forming at the Wilma Sunday night at 7 p.m. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be live and concert performances happening October 10th at 7 p.m. So there you go. Those are all your events, everything that's happening there. I thought it was going to be short today, but I guess I've been kind of rambling on and on. But if you want more information, go to MCAT.org. You can find me on Facebook. You can also find me on the YouTubes. All you got to do is look up Wake Up Missoula. It's not that hard. It's actually pretty easy. So without further ado, I want to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Randall.